Hello, and welcome to week four of our class, in which we're going to look at colonial life in the American Revolution. This week looks a little bit different because I'd like to use some information from a class that I taught that specifically dealt with um, the American Revolution and, and this time period. And so that's why the things that come to you this week look a little bit different because it's from a, a different book. But the information is still very much the same that you find in our, our weekly chapters. This week, the information that we're talking about goes from around page 26, Colonial Life, through about page 32, where the American Revolution begins. And the American Revolution um, will take us through in our book up to and stopping at the top of page 36, where you're going to stop at the 1800s. And that's kind of what we're going to look at first. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time discussing colonial life as I want to spend the bulk of the time talking about the American Revolution, hence the slide that's on the screen. But just to highlight a couple things which you'll see in your text as you uh, read through um, the social studies content text, beginning on page 26, they talk about some of the different people who founded and formed some of the different colonies. Guys like Roger Williams, Ann Hutchinson, William Penn, um, for Pennsylvania, you know, with the Quakers, we should all be familiar with that, right? Um, different events that they that they cover, um, things like the the Great Awakening, you know, a religious movement through um, the the defining event, the French and Indian War, and I, I want to kind of spend a moment on that because that really leads into the American Revolution. Okay, so what does the world look like? on the eve of the American Revolution, okay? So if the American Revolution, really things start to heat up about the 1760s, um, what does the world look like 1730, 40, 50, on the eve of the American Revolution in 1776? Here's what's going on. The, the Spanish rose to power and eminence in the late 14, 15, and 1600s through their impact in North, Central, and South America. And they got really, really rich. France and England wanted a piece of that, and so they settle in, 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 North, in, in North America. English kind of on the coast, the French go in through Canada and kind of settle in uh, in different portions. And what, what the English and the French decide is that um, Spain has Florida, and they've got Central and South America. They eventually take most of what we would now call, like, Western America, you know, like Arizona, Nevada, California, Texas, that kind of thing. Not yet, but that's, that's their piece of the pie in North America. England and France decide in, like, the 1750s that, hey, once and for all, we need to determine who is going to rule North America. Is it going to be the English or is it going to be the French? So they decide to go to war. That's what European nations do when they can't get along. They just like to go to war. So the French go to war against England. It's kind of deceiving because the French and Indian War was not between the French and the Indians. The French and Indian War was really the French with their Indian allies fighting the English and their Indian allies. So it's interesting that certain native groups threw their hats in with uh, different different European nations to see who, which of the superpowers is going to fight. Well, long story short, France lost. Okay, and England takes over, and and that's why you have the formation then of all these the various colonies that eventually become the United States. England gains control of the bulk of the east and, and um, kind of moving west. France still maintains some territory, but they're greatly weakened post-French and Indian War. Now, as you know, with the last, I don't know, what, 12, 13 years that we've been at war with terror, um, wars are expensive, and it costs lots of money. And when a government needs money, what do they do? They raise taxes. And so, just like in the um, modern world where when our government needs money, they tax us, European nations have been doing it. The ancient world, they did it in the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the ancient Mesopotamian Empire. When you need money, you tax your people. So, England says, hey, we need money because uh, we just protected you guys, you colonists, and we said, um, it is time for you to pay for the freedom that we just got you. And it's, it's really at the end of the French-Indian War that the feelings 
uh, the ill feelings between the colonists in North America occur with the English government. That's kind of where that's that's where this starts. But the, those ill feelings don't make sense if you don't understand um, the background to it. Because the American Revolution didn't just happen. You know, the colonists weren't just like all of a sudden pissed off at their government and like, hey, you know, what the hell? Why are you taxing us this way? They weren't necessarily opposed to the taxation. They were opposed to the different ideas that the government was trying to do. And we're going to get into that here in a moment. So here's really the first event, okay? The Proclamation of 1763. This is, um, and the book sort of briefly talks about this, starting with, um, as you look into the American Revolution, it, it does talk about this, and it kind of paves the way for that. Well, there was an event, Proclamation 1763. Basically what it said is the Appalachian Mountains are the boundary line. Colonists, you can't go west. Um, the colonists were pissed because they said, hey, we just fought a war of conquest against the French. We kind of want to go where the French were so we can settle it. England said, no, don't do it. Um, and England said, kind of for made sense, said, we just fought an expensive war and we can't afford another Indian war. So we need money now to pay for our past war. So stay put, colonists. Colonists were pissed off about that. Well, then in 1764, um, they renew the, a different act, a, a sugar act. And what they say, is, and what happens is, there was, it's almost like there was like a government audit or something. The prime minister sort of does this internal government audit and says, you know what's interesting? The colonists, they're not really paying their share of taxes for the empire. Um, there was a system called mercantilism. Mercantilism means that colonies exist for the sole um, improvement of the mother nation or of the mother country. Um, meaning a colony exists to simply give money and stuff to the government where the, where the government exists. That there's really no other reason to have a colony. And so because of mercantilism, the English government said, you guys need to you, and when I say you guys, I mean the colonists. The colonists, hey, yeah, you, you colonialists, you need to give us money. And compared to the rest of the empire, it's interesting that the colonies were actually paying significantly less money than any other Englishman at the time. And yet, I find it funny that the colonists kind of complain that, hey, you're taxing us. What, you know, what the hell? That's actually kind of false. They were not being overtaxed at all when you compare what they were paying compared to others. We're going to look at that in a minute. So the Sugar Act, what's this? What it does is it lowers taxes on um, like molasses and stuff, but it taxes sugar and other goods. Um, and what it did is it greatly increased penalties for smuggling. And it's funny because some of our great founding fathers, like um, John Hancock and I think Sam Adams, they were no they were known as smugglers. You know, they're like the uh, American Revolution version of Han Solo that they smuggle stuff even when you're not supposed to. Um, and why do you think they were so pissed off about all these taxes coming up now that are going to get them in trouble for smuggling? Well, because they're going to lose money. That's a big point that Howard Zinn, I think, may maybe he's taking it too far. I don't know. But that's his big point, is that the American Revolution wasn't about justice and equality. It was about economic prosperity for a very select group of people, particularly the Founding Fathers. That's sort of a different way of understanding the American Revolution, isn't it? That it wasn't about our freedom, it was about keeping a few people rich? Hmm, we'll see. So, for some reason, the Sugar Act violates, there's these two long-held beliefs that the colonists had, and it's one that you can't tax us without our consent, and then there's this sacred notion that Englishmen were entitled to trial by jury. Remember, that, was, that goes all the way back to the Magna Carta that we talked about, that said, you cannot find me guilty until you prove it, uh, and we need to have a fair trial. <coughs> um, and, and so that's why they were so pissed off about this Sugar Act. Take a look at this. When you compare the colonies compared to every other person under English rule at the time, the colonies were the least taxed portion of the empire. Also interesting to note, Americans were generally wealthier than any other countrymen across the Atlantic in England at the time. So that means the grievances seem to be less about taxes than about constitutional political issues that raise the tax, like courts, juries, and consent. So 
I often am amused when people, you know, who are talking about American history say, oh, well, the, you know, how dare that British government tax without representation, blah, blah, blah. Um, no, really what the issue is isn't that there there's this unfair taxation. The taxation was coming because the colonists weren't paying their share. They were pissed off that they were going to start losing local money um, and losing profit. So it's just, it's a fun little twist to American history. So to the government, from the British perspective, the taxes were a small price to pay for defeating the French and keeping them safe on the North American frontier and for running the colonies. In the colonial perspective, they're pissed off that they're now paying for a war that doesn't let them go west. And they're upset now that there are no penalties for smuggling and new penalties for... Um, for the you could you could be con convicted without a trial by jury, and so maybe it's not necessarily about taxation as it is about the constitutional implications of the taxation. I don't know. We'll see what you think, and maybe that's too great of an analysis for something that has oftentimes been simplified. So then you have the the Stamp Act. Um, we kind of know the story about this. The Stamp Act, what it did is it was legislation that required the colonists to personal special stamps, and they had to, basically it was a tax on stuff. Um, and this is actually a response to the colonists being pissed off about the Sugar Act. Um, <laughs> so um, I guess maybe maybe it's bad parenting when your kid gets pissed off about one thing. What do you do? You make it even harder or worse? I don't know. Does that work? Or does that work as a teacher when you've got a student who reacts badly to a punishment, so you decide to double this punishment and make it worse? That's what the British uh, government tried to do. They imposed the Sugar Act. The colonists were pissed off by it. They said, hey, back off. Here's the Stamp Act. Let's teach you a lesson. Um, it makes it worse. And, and it sort of backfired. Here's how bad it backfired. Um, each one of those red little dots represents a protest that exploded across the colonies. Um... In, in response to the Stamp Act. So when we talk about in the modern world, you know, we have protests and marches all across the nation exploding um, in regards to current political situations. Um, that's not a new phenomenon. That's not anything new in American history. Uh, that has been um, a method with which people have spoken out against what they view as an injustice um, for quite some time. And as a result, nine of the 13 colonies send representatives to the... Um, to the Stamp Act Congress that they get together. Britain eventually backs off. They say, whoops, sorry, uh, we'll repeal the Stamp Act. So what happens is Parliament, they repealed the Stamp Act, but here's the thing. you Governments need taxes to exist, okay? I'm, I, I obviously, I hate paying taxes too. But our country cannot function. Our roads can't be maintained. Our schools can't be filled with people and teachers. And, and the very premise of everything that you and I experience every day that we take for granted is done because we pay taxes. And so the British Empire said now, hey, okay, we'll repeal the Stamp Act, but we still need revenue to pay for this war that we just fought for you. So there's a guy who by the name of Townsend, um, and he creates these, uh, these new taxes, these new laws. And what it does is it, it levies a tax on glass, paint, paper, and particularly tea. Okay? Um, it's interesting. Townsend, so he, he made a gamble on making a new tax and thought, okay, the colonists will be fine with this one. It actually backfired and it was worse. Um, and what's, what's interesting is that the Americans, they wouldn't accept this external tax, like a cust like, and they didn't like it. Um... So in response to the Townsend Acts, again, the colonists then, they boycott the, imp the importation, importation is that a word? The importing of all British goods. They just say, nope, if you're going to act like this, we're not going to take your British stuff anymore. So now interestingly, um, Britain then what they do, because the colonists are becoming rowdy. It's looking more and more like, ooh, the, the colonists are getting upset at us. So they, they send more military people to the seaport fronts. Places like Boston had a population of around, I don't know, 15,000 people. And what they do is they send 4,000 soldiers to station them there. Um, in 68, the British Britain, they seize John Hancock's personal ship, the Liberty, because they suspected him of smuggling. Um, and they thought seizing the ship would give them proof that they, that they needed. It actually didn't work. 
Um, they didn't find it. Though, interestingly, he was smuggling. They just, he was really good at hiding it. Um, people viewed this as an assault on his ship and as an assault on his personal liberty. Um, and they were pissed. Uh, even though he was smuggling and stealing revenue from the government. That's just a fun fact. Um, things come to a great uh, debacle when um, a protest erupts at the Boston Massacre. Um, we could, I could go on and on about the events at the Boston Massacre. Um, needless to say, the colonists, they threw bricks and rocks and, and clubs at the soldiers. A guy got hit. He got knocked out. He accidentally fired his gun. Uh, the British soldiers open up and they kill five people. Paul Revere paints this neat little picture and calls it the Boston Massacre, even though a massacre by definition is the mass killing of a multitude of people. Um, though a tragic event of the loss of five people, I wouldn't call it a massacre, but it was portrayed as a, a gross misstep on the British part, though it was actually an accident. Um, another fun fact, the guy who decided to represent the British soldiers, because he was like, hey, we're not a bunch of barbarians um, and savages, we can maintain government, uh, an unknown figure by the name of John Adams decided to be the lawyer for the British soldiers who killed the colonists. Um, this is sort of his step into the limelight for the rest of the American Revolution, uh, beginning with the defense of soldiers. Um, so again, fun little fact for you. So as a response to the Boston Massacre, the, 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 the British impose what they call the, the Intolerable Acts, and it basically really reigns in um, the colonies. And uh, long story short, the colonists get even more pissed off about this, and they call up the First Continental Congress to try to decide what to do. Um, interestingly, all of these people, like Mer th this, and, and the, the intolerable acts and all these other taxes, these are things that are hurting merchants. These are things that are hurting businessmen and and guys who import and export stuff. <coughs> guys like John Hancock and, and other American, um, famous American leaders. This is the point that Zinn's trying to make when he says, you know, the, uh, the American Revolution is about protecting the economic interests of a few guys. I don't know if that's necessarily fully true. At this point, I believe it is. But I do believe there was a shift in the views of the people. This, however, at this point, what I'm, we're talking about now, I do believe was about economic money. So, pushed, funded, and motivated by John Hancock and Sam Adams, Bostonians get all sorts of pissed. They dress up like Mohawk Indians, and they go on a, a multi-million dollar um, spree of destruction by dumping a bunch of tea into the harbor. Of course, you and I know this event as the Boston Tea Party. Um, <laughs> did you know that it was led, funded, and pushed by Sam Adams and John Hancock, who were losing money because of these taxes? Um, that's interesting. And interesting, too, we oftentimes think of this as uh, an outspoken event against injustice. I don't know if I'd call it that. Also, I don't know how defensible uh, a multi-million dollar um, looting destruction um, event is. Imagine in, think in your hometown, um, or better yet, think of the capital in Des Moines. What if I secretly... Funded, led, and um, motivated a hundred people to go to the Capitol and destroy about two or three million dollars worth of property at the Capitol. Do you think anybody would respect my actions? Do you think that would be respectable amongst others? Do you think that's a good way to have your voice heard to destroy government property like that? I don't think so. Did you know that that's exactly what the Boston Tea Party was? That was a destruction of government property in, in a very costly one at that. Um, and I, I just think it's an interesting way to, um, to think about the events that are going on. So to punish the, 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 the colonies, they passed the Intolerable Acts. That's what the colonists call them. And the British call them the Coercive Acts. In response to the Continental Con in response to this, they call up the Continental Congress, and it's here that Patrick Henry gives his famous speech, "Give me liberty, give me death." At this point, I don't think Patrick Henry was talking about independence from Britain. I believe he was talking about more freedom within the government system that existed. Um, 
we oftentimes portray Patrick Henry, give me liberty, give me death, as saying the, being the first person to say, I want to be free from um, British control. I don't think that's true. There's a great book by a guy the name of Leal called, I think it's called 48 Pages. I think it's something like that. Um, in which he talks about Thomas Paine as the single most important figure writing the, the pamphlet Common Sense that motivated um, people to break from Britain. And he argues that Thomas, that um, Patrick Henry actually wasn't doing that. So again, that's a more in-depth look at um, some of these different things. Um, this is just an overview of the different events, the acts that were going on. Um, and so here's what happens. Um, the guy who was in charge, they had different lords, Lord Dunmore, he makes an official announcement saying that um, offering freedom to slaves who joined the British and trying to put down now what is viewed as a rebellion. Um, as a way to put down the rebellion, the British started to look for weapons caches that they knew that certain individuals were um, hiding, particularly at uh, Lexington and Concord. Um, and so the British march all night and they look for that stuff along the way. They get shot at. Hence the whole, the first shots, the shot heard around the world, right, uh, with the poem, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. Um, <coughs> interestingly, Paul Revere, he actually didn't make The Midnight Ride. He got arrested like 20 minutes into the ride, and other people completed it. Paul Revere did not. Paul Revere got all the credit, but he got arrested. He didn't He didn't do anything. Um, I, I don't know if you knew that or not, but that's, that's what happened. Um... And so you now have basically full-scale war, uh, culminating into the Battle of Bunker Hill, eventually going full out into um, the various events of the American Revolution. But I, I wanted to spend time talking about the events leading up to, you know, now the full-scale war. Um, and and it... I think Zinn has a point to say we should really critically analyze really what is the point, um, what was the point of the American Revolution? How should we understand the, the initial actions against the British government? Was it really about freedom or really was it about economic interests? I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how we, how we handle the two. Um, I won't get into the specifics of the American Revolution. Um, we all know that it culminates with the British defeat up at Yorktown by... Um, Washington and the eventual surrender. You have the Constitutional Convention where they thought they were going to rewrite the Articles of Confederation, but it didn't work. Um, so they decided to write the Constitution instead. Um, and that's really dealt with on page 34, 35, and up to the top of 36 in their text. And I strongly encourage you to take a look at that as well um, as it outlines in good detail those events. I mainly wanted to focus on the, the precursor um, events leading up to it. So the big idea is there was a bunch of laws that were leading up to the discord between the colonists and the British government. There was uh, events that disrupt the relations. I believe that common sense was what led to the Declaration of Independence. I'm not sure. It, I, I think Thomas Paine was the single-handedly most important guy to fuel the flame of independent feelings amongst colonists. Um, one cannot underscore the fact enough that Washington really held was the glue that held it all together. Um, there's a great book um, by the name of Benson Bobrick called Angel in the Whirlwind, and he talks about uh, George Washington and talks about... It, it's a great summary and overview of George Washington. Um, Washington really was a, an unbelievable figure. Um, another fun way to look at Washington, there's a book by the name of, um, I think it's called American Revolution. Um, it's, it's by uh, a, his, a historical fiction author. His name is um, either Michael or Jeff Shar. I don't remember which one. One of them was the father and one's the son. I can't remember which one is which. But they, he, wrote, he wrote a book about the American Revolution, and it's fun because he gets you in the mind of these people. It's historical fiction, but it's based on strong historic fact. And I think it does a good job of showing you um, just how influential Washington really was. The culminating event is the Treaty of Paris, which marks the end of the American Revolution um, and the formation of the United States, which we now all call our country. Important stuff, big ideas. 
lots of things to mull over and chew on and think about. I hope this uh, gives you something to think about and ponder as you think about um, the forum posts um, in, in dealing with the material, particularly as we talk about with Howard Zinn and some of the things we read in the text. Have a good week, everybody.